If you're a regular Geeks Guide to the Galaxy listener, please rate and review us on iTunes or using the podcast app on your phone. We currently have 965 five-star ratings, and it would be great to get that up to 1,000. And I want to give a special thank you to Uneven Keeled and VSO212, who both just gave us five-star reviews. Uneven Keeled writes, A great show with great guests. I thoroughly enjoy each episode, even if I'm only somewhat familiar with the topic. And VSO212 writes, If you're interested in sci-fi, this is your show. Very thoughtful examination of all kinds of sci-fi books, movies, and shows. A must-listen for sci-fi fans. So big thanks again to Uneven Keeled and VSO212 for those great reviews. All right, so now let's get to our show. Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 464 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Today on the show, we'll be discussing Ursula K. Le Guin's classic 1969 novel, The Left Hand of Darkness, which is often listed as one of the best science fiction novels of all time. It's also set in the same universe as The Dispossessed, which we discussed back in episode 460, so definitely check that out if you missed it. And this will include spoilers for everything in the book, so just be aware of that. And I'm joined by three guests. So first up, we've got Sarah Lynn Mishner, making her 23rd appearance on the show. She's a trans-supporting Ravenclaw Trekkie maker feminist who writes at Medium and lives in Connecticut with a Renaissance engineer and a small zoo. So Sarah, welcome to the show. Happy to be here. The next up, we've got Rajan Khanna, making his 18th appearance on the show. He's the author of the post-apocalyptic novels Falling Sky, Rising Tide, and Raining Fire, and his short fiction appears in magazines such as Analog, Lightspeed, and Beneath Ceaseless Skies. His articles have appeared on Tor.com and LitReactor.com. So Raj, welcome to the show. Excited to be back. And also joining us today is Lisa Yazik, making her 8th appearance on the show. She's Regents Professor of Science Fiction Studies at Georgia Tech, and is author of the nonfiction books Galactic Suburbia, Sisters of Tomorrow, and The Future is Female. She also appears in the AMC miniseries James Cameron's Story of Science Fiction. So, Lisa, welcome to the show. Hey, hey, happy to be here. Okay, so let's start off with Sarah, and have you tell us about your history reading The Left Hand of Darkness? Um, it would have been when I was at Borders. Um when I was working at Borders in like 2000 to 2002, um, around that time, it was sort of one of those things where I remember sitting in the break room and talking about, you know, the sort of masculinity of science fiction, because I had absolutely no goalposts in terms of my foray into science fiction. When I started reading science fiction, I was sort of investigating in the dark. I mean, my my parents were not readers at all. Um, I had gone to a Christian private school for part of middle and uh, part of high school, and we were actively discouraged from reading anything secular. Um, and so, you know, during that time, I went through this horrible dark period where all I was reading was, you know, this fat textbook from Bob Jones University Press of horrible short stories written by staff there, basically written by pastors, you know, and, and all of it was about a fifth grade lead, reading level, even though they were teaching this to us in ninth grade. Um, like I had a, you know, I, I had a teacher stop me in the hallway because I was putting a Willa Cather book in my backpack. And she was like, does your mom know you have that? <laughs> you know, like imagine discouraging a ninth grader from reading Willa fucking Cather. I mean, she's basically like Laura Ingalls Wilder for grownups. But so it took me a really long time to get out of that and, you know, sort of figure out, okay, how do people go about picking books? How do people read when they have absolutely nobody to guide them? And that's why I think when I worked at Borders, it was such a magical time because I was surrounded by readers for the first time and it was beautiful. And so how do you remember exactly how you came to pick up The Left Hand of Darkness? I had been talking in that break room with uh, one of the employees and I was trying to remember which one, but it doesn't matter. And he, <laughs> he was talking like, you know, if you if you love science fiction, you gotta you gotta get away from the boys. I think he was gay. 
I'm pretty sure he was gay. And he was like, you need to read Octavia Butler. You need to read, you know, Ursula K. Le Guin. You need to read Atwood. And, you know, I had never heard of these people because of the upbringing that I had. And so, you know, it was one of those things where I went to that section and I picked the one with the coolest title. And The Left Hand of Darkness is a great title. It's just, it has this sort of gravitas to it. Um, you know, so, and that was actually a really good one to start with. So. And so then you're reading it like on your breaks or something. You have like, like how long, you're, how, so you're reading in like little pieces or something? Well, no, I, I wasn't working all the time, Dave. I still went home. <laughs> like <laughs> it was one of those things where like every couple of months they had like employee discount days. And so you would just, you know, you would get like 30% off or something. And so you would go and, you know, buy 10 books that you were, you had your eye on. And, you know, take them home and, and read them. So, yeah, it was a great time. Yeah, I've never worked at Borders. I actually applied for a job there and they didn't hire me. But I always assumed <laughs> yeah. it was like a hearth or something where just everyone lives there the whole time. I don't know. This this is how, how little experience I have working in bookstores. <laughs> but, um, okay. Yeah, just the way you said it, it made it sound like you were actually reading it in the break room. But I, I mean, some now. people did that. The very hardcore people who were also tended to be not very social they they definitely did that uh -huh. and that was that so that was the first of all those authors that you read was left hand of darkness yeah that's pretty that's a pretty cool story so raj can you top that story for uh how you can <laughs> well, read I, left hand of darkness i can at least say that i worked at borders and barnes and noble so I, no i'm just kidding um yeah <laughs> I, I don't know if i can top that story i've been trying to think when i first encountered it and i've been having a hard time pinpointing it i know we read Le Guin, I took a fantasy and science fiction course in college, which was in the early 90s. And I know we read Le Guin um, there. I know we read the word for world is forest, um, which is also, I think, part of this this um, cycle. But I, I want to say that I read it there. But if not, I read it probably sometime soon afterwards and kind of bounced off of it. And And that was because of my limitations at the time. I wasn't ready for this kind of, you know, subtle, complex book. You know, I was used to reading kind of big action-y kind of, you know, explosions or fantasy books or whatever. Um, and I think this is probably just reading for this podcast. I think it was the third or fourth time I've read it. But um, the second time I went back years later with a little bit more maturity, um, it just blew me away. And, and it was, and, and I, I am not someone, I know a lot of people grew up reading Earthsea and as a fantasy person, I don't even know how I missed that whole series, but I did. So this was my first real kind of connection to Ursula K. Le Guin, but just the, the subject matter and, and, and the way that it was presented and the way that like my mind kept saying like, this shouldn't work, but it completely works. Um, I was just in awe of it. And so it's always kind of stuck with me from that second time. And so I think, I would say this is probably about the fourth time because I think I've reread it since then. And it's one of those books, which I think, you know, it, it defines great books where every time I go back to it, I, encounter new things and I get a new angle on what's happening and I, and, and appreciate it even more. So with that first time when you bounced off it, did you read like a chapter and you're just like, nope, not for me? Or did you make it farther than that into the book? I think it was farther. I can't, I, I'm, I can't remember if I finished it or not, to be honest, it, it might've been something. And, and if I had been reading it for school, I probably kind of like skim, skim read it through <laughs> to the end, just so that I got the, the points and could like, you know, do a quiz or a paper about it. But um, I definitely didn't connect with it. I think that was the thing. And I thought, I think, I, I mean, I could probably list reasons why, but that would interest nobody. But like, I, I think I didn't get sucked into the kind of, um, you know, it's not, it's not a book of big, you know, action sequences. There's, you know, there's whole pages where they're trudging through the cold and the ice and, you know, having like little moments here and there. And that now is like one of my favorite parts of the book. But like back then, I just didn't have the the ability to appreciate it or at least to, to give it the time that I think it needed um, to appreciate. Yeah, to say that there's whole pages where they're trudging through the snow and the ice might be a bit of an understatement. There's right, like right. 70 pages. It's like the whole book. Doing that. 
Yeah, that's actually my favorite part of the book. It's like the one part every time I reread it that I really like. I mean, I, I, you know, there are different things I like every time, but I consistently, I love the trudging through the snow part, but I grew up in Michigan. So, I, you know, I may just have a different relationship to snow than some of you. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Well, well, yeah, let's, let's, let's uh, get to that in a little bit. I'll just say that this is my first time reading this. Um, you know, the sort of the, the whole, the sort of premise of these book club episodes is I want to read some books that I'm embarrassed that I, I have not, haven't gotten around to reading. Um, but so how about Lisa? Do you have anything else to say about your uh, history with uh, Left yeah. Hand of Darkness? So um, I've, I've never worked in a bookstore either. So we, we have that in common. Although I did work at a library <laughs> one summer, a university library. So not quite the same thing, but but there were still a lot of books around so close, right? Although it was an engineering library. So we were talking about science fiction, many of us, but there were no science fiction books actually there. Having said that, um, I actually read um, Left Hand of Darkness for the first time when I was pretty young. I may be a tween, I want to say. Both of my parents were science fiction readers, and they were real fans of the new wave. So we had like lots of Sam Delaney and Joanna Russ around in Le Guin. And so I actually, um, I read Le Guin after I had given Delaney and Russ a whirl. And um, in some ways, I definitely understood Le Guin better than Delaney. But I, I got to say that at that time, I really preferred Russ and Delaney. And I think, you know, you're, you're a teen um, and, you know, the funk and the anger and the wit like that all really is appealing. And Le Guin's very intellectual. Right. And um, and also witty in her own way. But but, you know, when you're 12 or 13 or 14 and sort of down with sex, drugs and rock and roll and science fiction, <laughs> like it's just not really maybe where your head is at. Right. So much. Um, and then this, you know, I've reread it since that a few times uh, once after um having spent some time with Le Guin and then, um, you know, again now. So I guess I've read it three times. Um, but, you know, like like Raj, I feel like I, I get different parts out of I get different things out of it each time. Um, and this time, what I thought was really funny, which I always remember, of course, obviously, that it's about this guy who has to come and try to deal with this race that has a very different sex and gender system than his. Um, but I had forgotten like how quickly they resolve everything on the ice because you expect them to get on the ice and, you know, that there's going to be this big emotional moment like there would be in a Hollywood film. And <laughs> she deflates it so well. I, I really enjoyed the dryness of it this time in ways that I didn't when I was younger. Yeah, well, let's let's set up the premise. So this is, yeah, it's, it's part of Le Guin's Hanish cycle. And so the the premise of the series is that there's this interstellar civilization, an enlightened interstellar civilization called the Ecumen. And the Hanish are kind of aliens, but they seeded a bunch of planets in the distant past, including Earth. So so humans are actually members of this Hanish race. And so um so this envoy from the Ecumen, from this enlightened civilization named Genli I, comes to a planet called Winter. And the people on this planet are the results of a genetic experiment where they, you know, on about a month cycle, most of the time they're uh, they're non-sexual. They don't have any um, sexual desire. And then a couple of days out of the month, they turn either into a man or into a woman. And that's when they have sex and, and procreate. And, and if they get pregnant, they stay pregnant or they, you know, they stay female and pregnant for the duration, for the gestation. Um, but otherwise, you know, they they go back to being um, sort of asexual. Um, so uh, what does everyone think of that summary? Anything else we need to explain about the the basic Just premise that they, of this? Just that they go back to uh, being asexual after the end of lactation, which I thought yes. was one of those details that you would not have gotten from a male writer. Yeah. Like a male yeah. writer would be like, yes, a, as soon as it comes host. out of the baby, <laughs> then, you know, then you're done. Like, no, no, there's also that whole period where, you know, you're basically ma still making food. Yeah, you, you are the food. That's that's really yeah. it. Yes, <laughs> you're the food machine. And that's yeah. But no, it, and, and it recognizes that. And I thought that that was pretty, pretty great, too. I agree, Sarah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so, um, and also, I guess there's uh, uh, the, the the planet Winter. It's a very cold planet, and so most of it is these gigantic polar ice caps. And then there's just along the equator, there's this narrow band where it's habitable, and so all the inhabitants live in basically these two. There's there's basically two big countries, and one of them is Carhide, and the other one is Orgarain. And Carhide is a monarchy. 
And org reign is described as a bureaucracy. It reminded me a lot of the Soviet Union or some sort of you know Eastern European kind of police state. Um, and so, as I said, Jen Lee has come to try to convince the people of these countries to join the Ecumen and, um, you know, run, runs into some problems. Um, I guess the, I'll, I'll guess the first thing I'll say is, you know, coming to this um, for the first time, you know, I, I've sort of heard about this book my whole life. And so I kind of, I had some, I guess, preconceived notions of what it was going to be about. And so I thought that this, um, you know, this idea that the, the Gathenians, they're called the, the locals, um, you know, become either male or female. I thought that was going to be, uh, you know, basically like the 100% focus of the story. And so I was really, um, I, was, I was kind of surprised how much of the story felt more like a, uh, a spy thriller and yeah. involved the politics and, and you know, and, and generally in, in the, these countries either accepting or rejecting Jen Lee's, um you know, envoy uh, status and everything. Um, so I guess, uh, I guess let's just start with that. So, um, so Raj, what, what's your reaction to me, to me saying that I was surprised how much of it was the sort of political thriller? Well, I mean, I, I, I think I can relate to that definitely because I mean, the, the thing that stuck with me from the first time I read it was the, the, you know, the gender, um, the, the, difference you know between the Gathenians and the rest of the humans and i think what made a big impact on me when i first read it was that it was one of the first i think it was probably the first book i've ever read that was science fiction and dealt with an issue of gender which is not something i'd ever seen before and you know i i think for a while i was like why why don't we do more stuff with this because you know like i'd rather read yeah i mean i'd rather read more anthropological style science fiction than about you know the physics of a of a war, you know hyper light engine or something like that um i find this stuff really fascinating and just as a thought experiment like what what does it mean but going back to it you know i i also had the the experience where i thought oh yeah that's it's all there but it's sort of just the background upon which the story is told and it obviously influences all these different aspects of the story but i really felt this time that it felt like a spy thriller, like a Jean Le Carre book or something where everything is kind of like, you know, it's all about the subtle relationships with people and the kind of, it's not the James Bond kind of spy thriller where you have, you know, or at least the movies kind of spy thrillers where you have guns and explosions and car chases. It's more of that kind of um, old school uh, spy thriller, which I appreciated in a way I don't think I had before because it 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 is all about these subtle currents that are going on. And people's positions and there, it is life threatening obviously but um i think that threat is definitely there from my perspective yeah so how, how about sarah what do you think about that gender versus spy thriller aspect i think that it it's because of how rich her world building is that that you would imagine that something that she saw as a structural part of the story uh, a, a cultural part of the story you, you know that you, you might imagine that that would be more important or bigger in the book than it than it or bigger in, to the plot than it is right um she's such a good world builder but not in the way that we are used to hearing that term you know she she has a lot more more in common with somebody like tolkien you know because she's she's a a world builder of uh, anthropological details of sociology and we don't have a lot of those you know uh there there are a lot of people that do world building and they are great at coming up with names for things, you know, but all, all of it's at a very surface level. And with the way that you read this book, it's like, you can't imagine it being written any other way because it feels so real. It feels like a report that you're reading from some guy who works at the UN in a thousand years. <laughs> you know, it feels very real because of that. And because a lot of the background stuff is and isn't the point of the story and it's I mean, it's part of what makes it so beautiful yeah i mean there's no question that Le Guin is just amazing at world building and at right at pro style and so this it has just such a um a sense of authority that as you say it, it feels so real and i guess that yeah and part of that is that it's about a lot of different things i, I feel like most science fiction novels if it were about 
the Gathenians, it would be, as I was expecting, to be like 100% or 85% about the Gathenian physiology. And this, there's, you know, there's the, there's that, but then there's also, there's all the politics and the different, uh, there's the religions. I mean, you know, there's like multiple religions and philosophies and, and all this kind of stuff going on. There's the environment and the, you know, the weather and the climate and everything. And so, so yeah, like it, it feels so real because there's just so many different things going on in this book. Um, we said, so, so Raj was saying that, um, that he had never read anything like this before in science fiction and that this is sort of, I think even still somewhat unusual in science fiction, but certainly I would think in 1969, uh, was pretty, uh, groundbreaking. Um, so Lisa, could you talk about that kind of like, what was the, um, the situation in science fiction that this book was published into? Yeah. Um, so actually, can I first talk about the gender and the, 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 gender versus the political science thing for a minute. And then oh, I'll yeah, do yeah, it because sure, I wanted to throw it, yeah. throw in, in it. So one of the things that it really struck me this time is I actually think it is always in every single instance, actually kind of about Gethenian biology. Um, what it, I think what it is, is when we hear there are these biological differences, I kind of always expect it to become a romance, right? And I think that that's where she subverts us is like, there's no romance. And that's hilarious, actually, because they have like a two, like two minute conversation and like knockout would, would be the center of the Hollywood movie, which would be where, hmm. right, where Estrovan goes into yeah. Kemmer and, you know, they, I don't know, fall in love or find their humanness through it. And if anything, they're like, oh, God, no, we're not having sex. That would be very alien. OK, <laughs> now, I, I totally don't agree with that. I think that like I don't believe I believe curious people would be curious about everything. But that's another story. Um but if you think about it, the entire political thriller is based on Jen Lee I messing up because he perceives everything through gender, right? Like he thinks the Carhydians are, I don't know what they're called, Carhydians? The inhabitants of Carhyde are womanish and lying to him, right? And then he thinks the um, the people in the bureaucratic state are manly and telling him the truth. And he just keeps, I mean, he gets himself in trouble because he just sees everything through gender, even, even and, and that's right, like that's his big mistake every single time. So I actually think it might be more about gender. It's just not about romance and sex. Yeah. No, that makes um, sense to me. And I think when Sarah, that fits with what you're saying that it's so structural in her world, it's built in. Right. And that's Jen Lee I's problem is he, he can see the biology, but he can't really negotiate the culture. All right. So anyways, so that's well, actually, let me, let, cool. Oh, let me on. jump in on that because, yeah. um, you know, sort of what, I, sort of what I always heard about the book or the, the critique that I always heard, you know, just since I was a kid, was that because Le Guin uses male pronouns for the Gathenians, uh, that they just feel like a bunch of guys, um, even though they're just, you know, they're described in the book as being, uh, you know, of, of taking on both sexes, that they just sort of feel like, like they're men. And I was expecting, honestly, to find that critique to be kind of overblown. But then reading the book, I was kind of like, oh, this is kind of fair. Like, I do sort of, they, they, it is sort of easy to slip into thinking of all the characters as men. And um, so I guess I would like to hear people's thoughts on on that. Like, do you feel that the, did the Gathenian sort of feel to you like, um, you know, like like people who take on both genders or, do, or do, you, do you find yourself slipping into just thinking of everybody as a man in the story? I I think that I, you know, one of the things you have to understand is that this is a very, this is exactly the kind of thing that a woman writer would do because I grew up in a world of constantly seeing myself as male characters because that's all I had. That was my only option. You know, seeing male heroes and seeing myself in them, seeing myself in Captain Picard, seeing myself in Ernest Shackleton. And that was a very normal thing for me. In addition to that, I was constantly told that he is sort of the, the, the gender neutral term that, that it's, you know, that, that it just means human sometimes. And, and we just go with that and we accept that. So it never bothered me because it was, you know, I was picking my battles. I was picking the battles of what was right in front of me. And so I accepted that almost like, you know, those sort of first generation feminists accepted those limitations because in a sense, I might as well have been raised in the 1950s because of, you know, my, my upbringing and my, my family and so forth. So to me, I feel like Le Guin just did that automatically because that was 
already the toolkit that we had to explain, you know, male or female. The male was the default, period. Uh, but the, on the good side of that, though, when I read it, I didn't see them as male. I did put, you know, because you you want that, that um, you know, you've been grappling with this whole idea of gender your whole life. And so I feel like it's probably a very different experience between a male reader and a female reader. Um, but, you know, to me, it was like, oh, yes, we've done this before, this business of the male is the default, and therefore I am already seeing myself in these characters. Yeah, that's really interesting. How about Raj? How did you see the the Githanians as you're reading it? So so this is an interesting question because I think there are different layers to it. So I think the first time, maybe even the first couple times I read it, I definitely felt that default kind of happen. And that's, you know, probably because I'm male. I'm used to reading a lot of times about males. Like I, I remember with um, Estraven, my first image that came to mind, which is not what she describes, and they actually go out of the way to say that this is very unusual, but was him with a beard for some reason, or 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 them with a beard, I guess, to be more accurate. But um, just because I think I, I the way that the character came across just seemed to fall into that mold for me for some reason, just him, uh, but not any of the others. But um, but this time reading it, like it felt it, I did feel like it, it felt dissonant, and it felt incorrect to me obviously based on the modern world that we live in and our current you know understanding of of gender i think um and the fact that you know at least in my world we free freely use pronouns you know to address people that don't identify as male or female um so that kind of disconnect did exist um but also i think you know from basically what lisa was saying i mean th there's a level where if you're viewing this as, you know, I always say Genli, but generally whatever way you want to say it. And I think that's only because of Getty Lee and like Genli I just seem to oh. kind of match up in my this head. It's going to be like the whole GIF versus GIF conversation. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I'll, yeah. I'll defer to the group and say Genli. But um, Genli, I think, is the one that you can say is choosing the default of male. Okay. Because to him, yes. I, I think he even says that, you know, the way we default God to man, to, to he I'm just going to, you know, default everyone to he. And that is the lens, especially, again, on this reread, re I, I found it very strongly that that is the lens by which, you know, the whole story is told through, like like Lisa said. I mean, that's exactly it. So, um, it, you know, like I found myself wondering how much of it was Le Guin defaulting, which is completely understandable, um, and also how much of it was actually intentional to, to just kind of make that the 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 default for this character and then to have us as the readers understand as we read through that that's a, a, a byproduct of his point of view and not necessarily the authorial viewpoint of it although she yeah i, I mean i read she later came to regret doing that and and apologized yeah. for it yeah she talked about that. We um, some of us watched a documentary on Le Guin. I think when we talked about um, the dispossessed, and uh, she talked about it in the documentary as well, regretting that. But I do think it's like a, a fortunate accident that works well with the particular character she's created. So lucky Le Guin, you know. Mm -hmm. um, well, so, so this was one of my things reading the book was that I it, it actually took me kind of a long time to to sort of grok the fact that Jen Lee was sort of you know, not great. Cause I mean, he's, he's sort of presented as this representative of the, of the acumen of this enlightened civilization. So I sort of, my, my, my default stance toward him was that he's wise and enlightened and, and everything. And then just sort of, as the book goes on, you know, there's, there's just more and more things where you're kind of like, Oh, this guy's kind of sexist or he's kind of a jerk, you know? And I wasn't sure at first, like, Oh, is this because this book was from 1969 and, you know, it's just sort of, a, a bit of a product of its time, but it becomes pretty clear as the book goes on that we're intended to, um, to be, you know, or that, that, that generally has this, this character arc that he, that he goes on. Um, so, so why don't we, why don't we get into that? So, so Sarah, what did you, what do you think of, like, do you like generally, or do you find him sympathetic or like, how do you feel about him? Well, first of all, I also say Genley, so I don't know. We <laughs> might have to be at two, two versus two over here, but, um, I, I feel like, I think what you were saying about it, his being sort of this this default character and initially he feels like he's in control and then you realize, oh, wait, he's not. 
I think that's very intentional. I think that he is meant to be the classic male hero of colonialism. And I think that that you see a lot of that, her upbringing um, and her father being an anthropologist and stuff like that, um, you know, where Genli is kind of the colonizer. And even though it's not explicitly stated in the book, you know, because she's using metaphors and she's she's created this wonderful entity called the Ecumen, which feels very peaceful. It feels more like the United Nations. Uh, you feel like he is supposed to be, he sort of comes in with a swagger and he's talking about, well, he doesn't get this and he doesn't get that. And he's mistrustful of this person. He's mistrustful of that person. And he doesn't get that um, Estrovan is trying to help him. He doesn't get that Estrovan is trying to warn him. And so I feel like he realizes over the course of this, this story that he is the outsider. He is the other. And that I think is the transformation in, in the book that he starts out as I'm, I'm the leader or I'm the only one here. And in, in, in not in a alienated way, but in a, in a colonialism way. And then he sheds all of that through humility because he goes through these experiences and he realizes he, he doesn't understand this culture at all. And he starts to question himself and really see himself as the alien, you know, on this, this planet. I guess maybe this week this can um Lisa lead us back into the question I, I uh, posited to you earlier about what was the environment in science fiction like at the time. Um so let's let's talk about that like how do you see how do you see generally in the context of of science fiction of the 1960s? Yeah, well you you were starting to see people, you know, experimenting with um sex and gender identities by this point in time, right? You would have had like Delaney's I and Gamora would have been published by now and uh, which imagines these asexual spacers uh, who, um, even though they themselves are asexual, they create incredible desire in, an, in another subgroup of humans who, and you end up having a proliferation of sex and gender identities in some very complicated ways, right? And then uh, you have like Sonia Dorman's When I Was Miss Dow, which is this great story about an asexual alien race that pretends to take on uh, human sexual characteristics so they can trade with humans and then they fall in love and they think it's the grossest thing ever. And they like, no, God, never again. And um, so, <laughs> you know, it was in the air, right? So there are people who are playing with it. And that makes sense. This is the 1960s. We're beginning to see the revival of feminism, um, right? And the creation of like some of the new feminist organizations, like National Organization for Women. So, and uh, obviously we're right at the edge of like a Stonewall and, and, and the, the LGBTQ plus movement going mainstream again, and or maybe for the first time. But um, so this stuff is all in the air. So I think that, you know, Le Guin is definitely thinking about it at the right time, but no one had really put it together yet into a sustained novel. Um, well, I think some people had, but they hadn't been published. She was definitely the first one to the punch, right? Um, and that this, this was the first person to really pick up some, some, some interesting things that were beginning to happen in the edgier, more avant-garde science fiction and put it together with, like Raj was saying, a political thriller, like something that people would have recognized, a, a kind of pulpy court intrigue. In some ways, it's like really pretty classic science fiction, even though Le Guin herself says it's not. But, you know, um, and, and that those two things come together in some interesting ways. And, and I think that that, you know, you go, I thought, I bet you in the 60s, people went in for the court intrigue and came out like, oh, wow, that sex and gender stuff didn't see that coming at all. Um, so although it was in the air, I feel like she was really the first person to bring it together in this really important way for us. And it's still memorable today. Yeah, I guess we should maybe explain if people haven't read the book that the, the court intrigue plot basically is that um, Estravan is the prime minister of Carhide and he gets banished. Um, and um, then uh are we going to go with Genli? I'll go with Genli. I can do Genli. <laughs> uh, Genli goes to this this the neighboring country of Orgarain and sort of falls afoul of their police state and is uh, put into a sort of a forced labor camp. And Estravan comes and rescues him, and then they have to cross this this big glacier to escape. And so so and on the course of this journey, uh, Genli goes from from mistrusting Estravan to to seeing that Estravan uh, is you know his best friend uh, on this world. Um, I think it's and... Estraven. <laughs> Estraven. I, I say Estraven. it's like it's like Latin. Who knows? Everyone say what they want. I think that we'll, we'll figure it out. 
We can we'll just designate Sarah to be the um, the official <laughs> pronunciation guy. Yeah. Um, but so um, but but that's kind of Lisa. What I was wondering is to what extent Le Guin felt like, given how um, I don't know, potentially controversial or or whatever uh, the 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 um, sex aspects of the book yeah. were that that the the political thriller aspects were an intentional kind of um sort of you know I don't, what would you say sort of popular or you know sort of appealing genre uh rapping yeah and to, also to sort of I, sneaker... yeah well i mean i think it was i think it was more than that i think it was the style of the times if you think about it like sam delaney and joanna russ did this as well especially in the 60s delaney was writing all kind like the first novels he wrote, they're very sort of fantastic and pulpy. And uh, but they also have that crazy gender stuff that he'll become well known for going on. And Russ did the same thing with her early Alex the Barbarian stories. They were very much homages back to um, C.L. Moore's first, um, you know, uh, barbarian heroine, Jarell of Jory. And and yet at the same time, they were this incredibly powerful meditation on on gender and power. So. I think in part what what Le Guin is doing is she's she's pulling on something we see a lot of people doing and that maybe even defines the new wave, right, is taking these sort of old, traditional, very classic, almost pulpy science fiction tropes and making them new by making them speak to things that were part of our own moment. And that's something that Le Guin talks about in the introduction, at least to the version I had of The Left Hand of Darkness, is that she was really thinking about how 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 people in the moment that she was living in right in the 60s and 70s how how not only people were sometimes presenting as androgynous which was was again the style of course in the 60s um but but that of course people could can act in androgynous ways as well and and that part of what she wanted to do with the left hand of darkness right is to use science fiction as a funhouse mirror to the present and show us how we are already often androgynous and not always sexed and gendered in their own moment and you know, that that's an interesting point. Would she have had concern that the novel would not be published if it was uh, if it went kind of too explicit with the like if, if the oh, I, I see don't know if, if yeah, if uh, if Genley and well, Nistraven had had know, sex would that, you be know, maybe issue? maybe I mean, she never spoke about it. But right. Like authors are professional liars, as Le Guin herself points out <laughs> and in that introduction. Um, so, you know, we can believe what she says or not. But I do think that point is well taken. I mean, we know that when she published um, Nine Lives, which was a story about a group of clones who are sort of siblings, but sort of not. And they hang out and have sex together and they work together and all this. Uh, she published that story around the same time in Playboy. And she had to go by um she had to use her initials. They wouldn't let her publish under Ursula K. Le Guin. Not like anyone wasn't going to know who she was because she was well enough known, but like they were just like, oh no, a woman couldn't do this. And so, you know, yeah, there were definitely these weird sort of gender barriers there. Um, and and I think that in some ways they were, you know, more levied against women than men. Um, when Juanita Colson and I think it was, um, oh gosh, Marion Zimmer Bradley wrote a story that is, it's definitely contentious now, just as it was then, but it's a, a story that attempts to uh, explore uh, uh, gay identity and sexuality. It doesn't do it well, but it tries. But once again, you know, uh, it was considered really contentious and they made Juanita Colson go by a, a man's name because they're like, well, if we don't put a man's name in the story, no one's going to read this story about sex. So yeah, maybe Le Guin was thinking about it. What's interesting is she's never mentioned that though. Um, whereas other, both men and women from that period have really documented feeling like they had to be careful about that. So, um, I just don't know if it was her jam. I'm not sure she cared that much. I think that there are other issues that are maybe a little bigger. I mean, the gender, I don't know. Yeah. That's what I, I have think to it, say about it. Go on, I feel Sarah. like it would have been just sort of automatic for her. I mean, yeah, yeah you know, because it, even decades later, I mean, JK Rowling, for God's sake, was, would have probably written uh harry potter from the perspective of hermione she said she decided she made a conscious decision to write this from a male white uh protagonist because she wanted to not be poor anymore she wanted it to be a commercial success and that's a sad thing to say in the 90s that that, that we still had to do that and so i'm sure that there are still authors who do this today because not necessarily because anybody is actively saying you can't do this but because they want it to be successful. They want people to buy it. They want to tap into this existing, you know, 
market. I mean, one of the things I was thinking of when you sent us that uh, review, or not the review, the editor's initial rejection of her of her book is that the rejection sounded like it was written in 2021 about our very cynical uh, way of, of uh, book culture, you know, all the stuff that, that she was talking about when she won that award where she was going against Amazon and, and stuff like that. So we're like, you, we feel like, you know, when editors decide that, that the audiences don't have the complexity or the patience to handle book like books like this, they decide not to publish books like this, right? They decide to publish books where, things are blowing up and spaceships are being described and so on. So, you know, it's, it's, I Looks hope that, that we've, Raj would, yeah. would like. yeah. I hope that we've <laughs> moved on, but you know, yeah. <laughs> you know, at the same time, I do also think Occam's razor, like the universal he, if we're going to go back to that part of the Le Guin story, like everyone, Sarah, like you said, the universal he, it's very persuasive even now. Right. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then I remember like in, in the 70s, like I got kicked out of school when I was like six or seven for arguing with a teacher about the proper use of Ms, which was a relatively new <laughs> term that I was using it right, by the way. Um, and I got kicked out for standing up to myself for myself. Um, but, you know, I mean, but I think that that shows you like, I mean, that that a school would have come down that hard on like a six year old about that. Right. Like people really like we're even now we're very invested in certain. Of course, we're invested in certain very conventional notions of sex and gender. Look at the political backlash we're seeing against trans kids right now. My goodness. Right. Yeah. Um. So uh, the fact that Le Guin defaulted to he I mean, I do think in part women did that sort of unconsciously for quite a long time. Um. Definitely well, through, you know, the 70s and 80s. And then also, I you know. Okay. Anyways. Yeah. Oh, well, well, let me just, this is the, um, the letter that uh, Sarah was just alluding to. So yes. Yeah, so the, and, and Le Guin posted this on her website, just as sort of an encouragement to other writers who get rejected. Um, but so this is a rejection letter she got from an editor, I think on the, um, on the left hand of darkness and the letter reads in part, the book is so endlessly complicated by details of reference and information. The interim legends become so much of a nuisance despite their relevance that the very action of the story seems to uh, seems to become hopelessly bogged down and the book eventually unreadable. The whole is so dry and airless, so lacking in pace, that whatever drama and excitement the novel might have had is entirely dissipated by what does seem a great deal of the time to be extraneous material. Um, which strikes me as a uh, sort of gratuitously mean <laughs> uh, rejection letter, yeah. leaving all else aside. But um, um, But I don't know. I mean, at the same time... Um, Le, Le Guin herself described the book as slow paced. And um, I don't think that there's, you know, it's not entirely wrong to say that it, to, to worry that it would not be exciting enough for readers. I, I guess like, so, so Raj, you said that you, you know, when you were young, you found it, you know, you bounced off it. Reading it now a couple of times, what do you think about the the pacing? Do you still find it uh, slow in places or? No, I, I, I mean, I can see that perspective. And to be honest, like looking back, I do, I, I'm kind of amazed that it became as successful as it did, not because it's not good, but because, you know, I, I'm glad that readers were able to kind of, you know, read it and, and, and appreciate it. Um, cause obviously, like I said, I, I, when I was younger, I, I didn't. Um, but I think, I think as I've gone back to it, I pick up on, you know, it, it may not have like the, the big um, sort of, you know, traditional plot structure, but there's so many different threads going on at any given time that I think they're all interesting. And, you know, if, if it just, just the political stuff, you know, following that, and then, you know, when different characters are in danger and then they have, and, and then the, the world building kind of, which, you know, it's not like it happens all up front. It happens throughout and like with the different stories that are told interspersed with it, which you would think would would possibly like slow everything down and kind of stop it. But for me, especially this time, I found it, it actually helped because then it was like, oh, this is a cool little piece to add to this overall puzzle of, you know, understanding these characters, understanding this culture, uh, understanding the kind of influences that Le Guin was pulling on to put in there. Like, I mean, I love all the kind of Taoist um, influences in this novel and, you know, just even the title left, the left hand of darkness, there's that one section where, you know, they basically spell out this, um, I forget what it was like, just the saying from this one part of the world. But 
you know, I, I found myself just trying to kind of see all the different permutations, the different ways that 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 phrase and idea kind of connected throughout the book. And I think that was, you know, more than enough to keep me kind of engaged and, and going through it. Um, and uh, I, I'm kind of in awe of her skill to, again, take something that is probably slow paced and that isn't traditional and um, that can be sometimes challenging and make it so engaging. Like, again, like I, I, I did, I do like the trudging through the snow parts too, because it's not just, I mean, first of all, it's, it's beautiful descriptions in there and there's the world building in there. And then there's the character moments in there. And then there's also the tension of like, are they going to die? And like, oh my God, like well, their food stores are getting low. What's going to happen? And so there's all these different layers, I think in, in every single part of this book that, is what I think gives it its its strength and its and its uh, that makes it attracting to read. I think. Yeah, I mean, I didn't mind the interstitial stuff at all. Um, I did, which uh, just to explain, there there are these chapters in between the chapters, which are kind of like legends or history or you know things like that. Um, I'll, I'll read the the thing you were the little like poem you were just mentioning. I have that here. It goes. Light is the left hand of darkness, and darkness the right hand of light. Two are one, life and death, lying together like lovers in Kemmer, like hands joined together, like the ends in the way. Uh, Kemmer is, is what it's called when the, the Gathenians are like in their sexual um, phase of their cycle. Um, and uh, But I did, you know, and uh, like when I got to the end of this book, everything sort of fell into place, and I ended up really you know, liking it and understanding why everything was the way it was. But um, I, I confess that I, when they're going across the ice, I mean, I thought it was, I, I enjoyed it, but I, I, I wasn't, wouldn't say it was like page turning stuff exactly for me. Um, but so Lisa, you said that that's your favorite part of the book, right? So what is, what, is. what makes that your favorite part of the book? I, I think the descriptions are beautiful. I mean, I think as I've said before, like Le Guin, like narratively wise, never really grabs me. Um, and, and I know that in part that's her purpose. And so, you know, that's cool. She's got a purpose that just doesn't quite meet my reading needs. But like, but gosh, she's a beautiful writer um, and, and so smart. Um, and I and actually, the more we talk about this book, the more I'm liking it right now. Um, so what I love about the ice parts is, you know, um, Le Guin is also an ecological writer, and we don't often talk about that fact. Um, but you know, right? I mean, she was really in—I mean, invested in environmental uh, causes and things like that, and 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 thinking about our relationship to nature and rethinking our relationship to nature. And I'm just really struck by those descriptions. Um, I just—I find them very compelling for some reason, um, more compelling than the plot in some ways. Uh, there's there's a drama and a beauty in in nature that I think she does a really great job bringing to life. I just really like that a lot. Molly Gloss, I know, talks about Le Guin's writing uh, that way, and she probably does it more eloquently than I do. Um, but yeah, I really see. Uh, I just I'm I'm always really taken with it. I don't know. I can see that world. It's just very compelling to me. Um, and, uh, you know, it's like the uh, romantic sublime, I guess. It's just like she captures, she nails the sublime in, in a really cool way. And it's great because the rest of the book is pretty mundane, right? It's a lot of court intrigue and um, a lot of like, uh, yeah, I don't know. Just I really like the natural sublime there. I think that that's pretty cool. So that, that's well, why I like well, it. Oh, I just wanted to say, um, I love the myths. Can I just talk about those really quickly for a second? I just wanted to say, I love when we get all the myths and the inserted parts. And I think that like, what was funny about that editor who um, sent that letter to Le Guin is that they're completely right and completely wrong all at once, right? Like yeah, yeah. it is boring <laughs> and those do break apart the narrative and that's totally the point, right? And yeah. if you dismiss them, you're being as bad as Jen Lee I and I'm sticking with Jen Lee and you people can't make me change. <laughs> <laughs> um, but right, like if you dismiss them, you're making the same mistake he does because that's where you get the clues to figure out how you actually have to interact with these people on this planet, right? Is like the clue is in their culture. And he just was like, oh, whatever. So I just wanted to say that. Do you, do you have any idea, Lisa, who that editor was? Le, Le Guin keeps the person anonymous, but I, it just I don't know. It just occurred to me that last time when we talked about the dispossessed, that Lester Del Rey had this really harsh assessment of it. Right. And I it think made me wonder if you know, I was wondering, I'm thinking it could have been Del Rey because like it feels like a Campbellian or Del Rey kind of response. It's someone who's really invested in like classic science fiction. Um, 
and in the adventure aspects as well as the didactic aspects. So, I mean, like the only other person it could be, I was thinking is maybe Donald Wolheim, but I would think that he would have had enough narrative sophistication hanging out with like Judith Merrill and some of the other Futurians to maybe not respond that way. And he was into Delaney. So I would have thought, you know what I mean? So Del Rey, I like that. I think that that feels right to me. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing that just that just occurred to me as you were talking is, you know, you were talking about the the environmental sublime and everything. And one of the big countries in this book is called Orgarain. Yes, which exactly. sounds a lot to me like Oregon. Mm-hmm. And Le Guin was, you know, from Portland, Oregon, and um, you know, was really inspired by the Oregon, the beautiful Oregon coast and everything. And it seems like that can't be accidental. Except that she always imagines like her her future organs, they always end up being like these Soviet bureaucracies that are really drab. <laughs> and, and she does it all the time. She does it in Lathe of Heaven as well. It's like, it's weird. I, I can't figure out what that's about exactly. Does she, I, yeah. I don't know. Was that the future she imagined for Oregon? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> um, so I want to get Raj back in here. Raj, is there just anything else about the book that you, that sort of occurred to you uh, reading it for the third or fourth time? Yeah, actually. So, I mean, you know, the, the, we I talked already about the, the whole that phrase "left hand of darkness" and you know the 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 duality. You know, you you can't have light without darkness, uh, or vice versa. You can't have life without death. That comes up a lot. And you know, I was trying to specifically look at at that kind of threading throughout the the novel. And this time, it struck me how much. You know the the Gathenians, not the Gathenians, but the the in Carhide they talk about their shadow and they talk about, or maybe it is all of of you know the Gathenians talk about their shadow. But there's a lot of references to shadow and darkness and and all these kind of things. And then you have the um, what is the name of the religion from Orgarain? The the is it um, uh, do you, you do you remember? Yeah. So, so like that, that guy's all about light, you know, like, like you could see the light everywhere and like seeing everything all at once. And I kind of like, it just kind of struck me that, that in a way it's, it's really elegant the way that at the end, like, so these two nations, you know, one kind of represented by darkness and one by light, not necessarily darkness in a bad way, but are kind of at odds. They're about to potentially go to like the first war that ever existed in this culture. And, you know, Estrovin is, is really working to kind of prevent that and, and safeguard the future of his people. And in the end, you know, it's almost like the, the kind of union of those two ideas that where they have to come together um, rather than come into conflict, uh, you know, light and darkness, you know, a, a kind of, um, individual state versus a communal state and like all these different um kind of dualities you know that mirror the duality within the individual Gathenian, which is what 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 genley says at, at some point so i just really found and, and th- there was something just to me really beautiful on this reading about like i think like you said dave that when you hit the end kind of everything just comes together and like you see where all the different pieces were put in, but it, it's done so well that like, I don't know. I, I think it's a, it, it's a masterfully done novel and, and I'm just glad that I can go back to it and just find these different new ideas and, and concepts every time I read it. Yeah. So, so Lisa, could you talk about when um, left hand of darkness came out, kind of what was the, what sort of impact did it have on the, on the science fiction world? Yeah, when Left Hand of Cape Darkness came out, you know, actually, I I gotta tell you, I I didn't, I haven't looked up that much about it. I I actually can't tell you a ton about it. Um, I read a really, what I can tell you is I read a really funny um essay by Sam Delaney about the first time when he read Left Hand of Darkness. I don't know if any was this wasn't in the movie, was it? Did he talk about this in the? No, I don't think, in the I don't... Oh, this is really funny. Can I tell this story instead since this is what I know? No, well, we talked about his essay yeah. to read The Dispossessed, but we didn't talk no. about Oh, about no, but Left about literally the experience he had, like when Donald Wolheim handed him like Le Guin's first novel, which I guess would no, have no, been go, actually- No, no, please go ahead. Yeah, so I guess that would have probably been um, actually, what did that have Yeah, The Dispossessed. Yeah, so apparently um, when um, Donald Wolheim had read it, a copy of it and gave it to Sam Delaney and it was like, hey, what, what do you think we should do about this novel? And Delaney's like, I didn't really like it. And I thought that that was really interesting. <laughs> Um, but I, you know what, I actually don't know. Does, does anyone else know anything about the reception of this novel? Well, I, I could tell you what's on Wikipedia, which I read. Yeah. Okay, um, great. 
So, well, so there's the, you know, there's the, you know, people criticized Le Guin for, as we said, for using male pronouns mm -hmm. uh, for the Gathenians. Right. And um, there's an, uh, wait, do I have it somewhere? She, at one point she says something like it, 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 oh, she says it haunted and she, she was haunted and bedeviled by the matter of the pronouns. Um, and there was criticism that we never see the Gathenians. We only see the Gathenians in kind of stereotypically male roles, like politicians and soldiers and stuff like that. And some um, feminist critics said we should have seen them, in, you know, in taking care of babies and, and stuff like that to have more of a kind of you know, ref reflect both sort of views of them. Um, and then Although the other, there's one. I would actually like to say she gives us an image of a parent who's lost a child at birth. And that is something we, even today we don't talk about. So I want to give props to Le Guin right there on that one, actually. The feminists were a little bit off in that critique. Just putting it there. Go ahead, though, Dave. I just want to say that. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, let's see. It says, in a 1986 essay, Le Guin acknowledged and apologized for the fact that Left Hand of Darkness had presented heterosexuality as the norm on Gethin. Um and I, I guess some, you know, some critics said, you know, couldn't the Gathenians have had, you know, I, I guess either been sort of pansexual or else some of them, I, I, I guess, would have, um, you know, preferred same sex couplings in their um, Kemmer phase. Um, I think those were kind of the main. But oh, oh there's also this thing. So like. Um, in her 1976 essay, Is Gender Necessary?, Le Guin wrote that the theme of gender was only secondary to the novel's primary theme of loyalty and betrayal. Le Guin revisited this essay in 1988 and stated that gender was central to the novel. Her, early, her earlier essay had described gender as a peripheral theme because of the defensiveness she felt over using masculine pronouns for her characters. So it sounds like, yeah, like as much as this novel is admired, that, that there was sort of this long back and forth over you know, whether some of the choices she made were, were, were the right ones. Well, and remember, I think that what, what she, one of the things that she said was that, you know, originally feminists were very, very hostile toward women who, who enjoyed certain parts of domesticity. And I think that because of that, you know, you have them not appreciating the fact that she mentioned losing a child and, and what that means on a human level. And it's sad, but I understand it. Why, again, you see feminists wanting to pick their battles. And I, I think that feminists at that time had a really hard time saying, you know what, if it gives you fulfillment to be a mom, do it. And, and remember, Le Guin was coming from a completely different conception of family than most of the, what those women had been through than what I had been through. I mean, Le Guin had an abortion in 1950 and her father arranged it. Her father, who was Victorian, and he was so cool about it because she was crying and she was, you know, she was like, I'm, she said at one point, I'm being cowardly, right? I'm, I'm being, I'm evading the consequences of my actions is what she said. And he said something to the effect of, you know, yes, you are, but it is a lesser sin that you do this, then, then you sacrifice your talent and your training and the, you know, and he even said the children that you, um, will want to have in the future. And she did, she had three children that she would never have had if she hadn't had an abortion. So her experience of family was remarkably non-toxic. And so she was, you know, it's, it's, she's so refreshing on so many different levels for me because just reading her biography is inspiring and going, oh my God, it's possible to have, you know, and, and to have had this incredibly cool father who, you know, was born in the 1800s and yet arranged an illegal abortion for his daughter in 1950. It's just, it's amazing because he valued her mind. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary. I didn't know that story. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Where, where did you read that story, Sarah? Uh, she wrote an essay about her abortion. She actually wrote it. And again, she wrote it from the perspective of she, like she invented a character and she described this character as a princess and, you know, this princess who went off to, I forget what the women's college for Harvard was that she went to at the time. Uh, it has a specific name. 
anyway, she, where, wherever she went, the Harvard Women's College at the time, right? And she fell in love with, you know, a cad, if you will, from Harvard. Uh, and he knocked her up and he went home to his family and that was it. And she, she went home to her family and she was crying and she was like, what do I do about this? And was so, you know, was so warmly received and loved and taken care of. And it's just, it's extraordinary. Yeah, well, I didn't, I, I never heard that story. So that's, that's really interesting. Um, all right, we're running a little short on time here. Um, I kind of want to talk a little bit about the ecumen. And I don't know if there's anything else to say about the re religion in this book um, or, the, or the theme and the title and everything. Um, but I it's guess... not, sorry, it's not really religion, but I just wanted to say at some point that I really love that one part where he goes for the foretelling and just what yeah, she sets up in that yeah. crazy thing there is just, it's something magical about that idea. Cause like I completely bought it and I don't even know how it works, but it seemed kind of <laughs> amazing. I love the idea of a religion that like creates this like amazing human conglomerate to predict the future to prove to you that you never know the right question to ask like right. that is totally my life in academia i feel like sometimes so i was <laughs> like this is such a good insight um that was fantastic i thought yeah well let's let's walk through that a little bit so the so yeah so um Ganley goes to this the the religion is uh the, the main religion in carhide is called hadarada or something handarada um yeah handarada and so they have these um, uh, sort of prophets called foretellers, and they do this sort of group ritual where they're all kind of kneeling around in a circle, and one of them is in Kemmer, and then one of them is uh, schizophrenic or something. And it's just, yeah, it's it's super, super surreal and, and powerful. Um, and um, and Genley asks, his he's, he's allowed to ask one question, and he asks, will Gethin have joined the ecumen in five years and, and is told yes. And yeah, it just, it's given me kind of like chills even now just thinking about that scene. But um, does anyone else have anything to add about that, about that part? Have any of you read the diamond age? Cause that whole moment with the, with the foretelling, like reminds me of the drummers at the very end when they create that kind of crazy human machine. If you haven't read it, you're not going to know what I'm talking about. But now I'm wondering if that's <laughs> I, I not an homage. I have huh. not either. I have All not right. Never mind. Well, I'll, I'll have to find. I'll go find other people who have. <laughs> but, talk about uh, it with I, that. I, I'm gonna, I, I will just butt in for one more thing because it, it, it was another weird thing that occurred to me. And, and I, when I was reading this is that the structure seems very similar to Watership Down. And Watership Down came out, I think, a few years later than this did. But like you have this sort of uh, culture that – you know, in, in Watership Down, it's rabbits. It's weird. But they have their own, like, uh, terms for different things. You know, they don't have a shift breath or anything like that. But they have um, all these different words for how ra – it's, it's basically based around how rabbits really operate. But then there's this complicated social – uh stuff on top of it and 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 you know they're looking for a new home and them dealing with other cultures of rabbits and then in between there are all these stories about you know rabbit mythology essentially that then kind of connect and inform the rest of the novel and i thought to myself like I, is it possible that richard adams was like oh I, he read left hand of darkness and thought that's a pretty cool way to put a novel together i'm sure that's not actually true but like i just well really but there's found also it... there's the there's the prophet rabbit too right yeah yeah oh yeah fiverr right yeah so i mean it, i think there are if if he didn't know about it there are some amazing similarities there which i found kind of stunning in a way uh, well, let me just read this is what we learn about the ecumen in the book um it says the ecumen is not essentially a government at all it is an attempt to reunify the mystical with the political. It does not enforce laws. Decisions are reached by counsel and consent, not by consensus or commands. Uh, member states follow their own laws. When they clash, the ecumen mediates, attempts to make a legal or ethical adjustment or collation or choice. Um, and then we also find out, in a certain sense, the ecumen is not a body politic, but a body mystic. It considers beginnings to be extremely important, beginnings and means. Its doctrine is just the reverse of the doctrine that the end justifies the means. So basically the, the approach you take is more important than the goal, I guess, is, is what the ecumen believes. Um, they also have a, um, a sort of um, 
you know, in, until they've made contact, they're not supposed to interfere with the um, the civilizations that they visit, which kind of reminds me of the Prime Directive a little bit. Um, but I don't know. What do people... I thought it was interesting that the acumen um, is is sort of described in, as this mystic in these mystical ways when typically, you know, like the Federation is very, you know, non-religious in Star Trek. And, you know, Le Guin says herself that she's an atheist in the introduction to this book. So I thought it was interesting that that she's created this acumen as having these sort of mystical, you know, I don't know, mystical aspects to it. I, don't know. I mean, yeah, it was it was like somebody describing the Federation through poetry instead of just, you know, this sort of space bureaucracy, <laughs> you know, it's just it's cool. I mean, it's one of the things that, you know, you really like about it because it's very open ended and you're not entirely sure whether their intentions are super pure. Um, and, you know, it's one of the things that I like in general about her writing is that she she doesn't really have a. You know, I think because of her experience with observing colonialists, she will never come out and say, you know, or never, never really wrote a book where she was like, this is the way that everyone should live. And if everyone lived this way, it would it would work for everyone and it would be okay. No, she's saying, well, no matter what system you design for people, there will always be people who fall through the cracks. There will always be failures of that system for, you know, diverse members of the community um, for people that it that system wasn't written for, and there will always be outsiders. So it's one of the things that I really like about you know all of her writing. Well, so this, so this was one of my I guess this is maybe my my main issue with the story is that as I said, like Genley's pretty sexist, right? Like I just have I'll just read like a, a line or two here. Um, he says. Um, they lacked, it seems, this is the Gathenians, they lacked, it seemed, the capacity to mobilize. They behaved like animals in that respect, or like women. And when asked when asked by Estrovan, are women mentally inferior? He says, I don't know. They don't often seem to turn up mathematicians or composers of music or inventors or abstract thinkers, but it isn't that they're stupid. And it just seems like this, um, you know, this super enlightened civilization that spans 83 worlds in 100 light years can pick anyone to send as an envoy to this world where the inhabitants, you know, take on both genders. And this is the best candidate that they can find. And so it just seems like there's sort of a weird tension to me between the plot, which requires Ganley to go on this um, sort of growth, you know, this character arc of growth and toward greater understanding and enlightenment. And this idea that the, uh, the, the acumen is already enlightened and, well, Dave, that they I can mean, pick it. they can pick anyone. They're called the ecumen. I mean, right? Isn't the 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 tip off right there in the title? I mean, ecumenical means representing a number of different Christian churches, and Christian churches are by definition patriarchal. Yeah, uh, I, 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 right. I mean, that's the trick of the ecumen. <laughs> they seem so awesome, but they're ecumenical. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't think that. I think that if you read it thinking that that Le Guin thinks that the ecumen is this perfect ideal, you're going to miss out on what she's saying. Like, I right. think that she is right. saying that 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 this is not a perfect organization, and this this organization does still suffer from the, these colonialist thoughts and this way of thinking, where my my way is better than your way. It's not colonialist. It's patriarchal and misogynist in some ways, right? I mean, let's call a spade a spade there. So. Um... Yeah. And it's honestly, it's believable to me that that we might still be dealing with this shit in a thousand years because gender is so powerful. It is so it is literally deeply embedded in our language. You know, we have we have the we have so many English words for so many different things. English, the English language is one of the most like, you know, creative languages in terms of just being able to put pieces and, uh, you know, pieces of different languages together to come up with a new word like a Mr. Potato Head. And yet we struggle with this. They, them shit like they, they, them is the best we could do. It's sad. Yeah, I, I David, I, at first I, I agreed with you because I thought to myself, oh, you know, like I've read other books where like these people are well trained to pick up any subtle, like different things. But I think I think she makes a good point that. Every other society in this whole, you know, big federation has male and female members. And 
this is the it's almost like this guy goes in thinking like oh it's just like everything else and then is completely stymied by the fact that there aren't traditional gender roles and what i find interesting is that you know we're, we've been talking about gender i've been talking about gender but like the Gathen the Gathenians, um you know like they the way she depicts them it's it's actually biological sex right they don't have their gender identity is right. dictated by their biology at any given time based on the the environment and circumstances around them so there aren't at least in in this depiction you know like th there aren't different gender identities that are are outside the kind of chemer phase but we see the the influence of gender through Genley's eyes and the way that that like he's just defaults to these traditional roles and how he assigns uh values and qualities and 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 everything how he interprets everything and so it's interesting that the the actual gen the reveal of the influence of gender actually comes on his side rather than on their side because you know they are just for the most part you know they biological sex actually doesn't matter to them which is part of like the main thing like you know that when even when they were talking about the the history there like it for the most part it doesn't come into play unless it and unless camera is happening and then they have so many outlets to kind of deal with that that it comes and it goes and then you know life goes on and i mean it, it, i think i i actually ended up getting this the ebook of this um and so I had the forward and afterward that I think the rest of you guys had. But I, th I think that was interesting about Charlie Jane Anders uh, afterward about how, like, you know, it envisions a society where biological sex doesn't really matter, you know, and that's kind of amazing, um, even though the Gathenians themselves don't have like what we would understand as gender identity. Um, but the other thing I think is like, you know, I've been lucky enough to grow up in, or not grow up, I mean, like to, to be alive in a time where we are looking at, you know, issues of gender, um, you know, accepting gender fluidity, uh, you know, maybe we don't have the best pro pronouns, but we have pronouns for it. And I think back then, just even the idea of gender fluidity was not, you know, I'm sh it, it existed, but it wasn't um, as commonly, uh, uh, I guess, known perhaps as, as it is now. Um, and so, you know, she, like she says, she did, she wasn't writing really about the future. She was writing about the present. And so Genley is a, a, an accurate represent representative of people from, from the time she wrote it and a lot of people now as well. So, I mean, I think it's a fair depiction when you think about it in that context. Yeah. Well, let, let me actually, I actually have, um, there is something else that Charlie Jane Anders says, though, in that afterward, um, where she says, even as the book drives you to question all of our assumptions about male and female bodies, it never raises any questions about how gender shapes us independently of our biological sex. Um, Agreed. And she, Charlie Jane Anders, is, is um, you know, very complimentary of the book overall, but I think this is a pretty fair point that yeah. the implication in the novel is, seems to be basically like that the Gathenians can either become male, in which case, yeah, both their sex and gender and gender expression and roles and everything are male or vice versa with female, but doesn't sort of raise the prospect of people not fitting, you know, not fitting into their gender roles. Right. And early feminists sort of picked that up, too, I think, when they critique the fact that there are no like either lesbian or gay hookups in right, camera. Right? right. So it's I think that's a, a critique along a continuum there. Right. And and that is Le Guin's so invested in like this whole Taoist thing and thinking through binaries. And then when you treat gender as one more binary. Right. That doesn't quite map to. Uh, experience as we are expressing it in the modern era, and I, I, to me, that feels like the biggest disjunct in the book these days. Yeah, yeah. Although she did talk about Kemmer houses, and and maybe it's just my modern context. I assumed that that was like you just go into this place when you're in Kemmer, and you can have all kinds of whatever you know. Oh, I hope so. Sex that you want. I mean, but <laughs> I you know, so. maybe that wasn't intended. <laughs> I, I'm oh, still thinking now that maybe it was just a brothel <laughs> of some sort. But um, I hope you're. But right. yeah. <laughs> oh, I want you to be right. I totally okay. Good. Oh, I like that. I mean, actually, um, it says that um, Le Guin wrote two shorter pieces, "Winter's King" and "Coming of Age in Carhide." Later, that were kind of written in response to some of this this criticism that the Left Hand of Darkness received. And I haven't I haven't read either of those, but um, 
I, I think my understanding is that she wrote those specifically to address some of the, the criticism that she had gotten. But I don't know. Nobody's, nobody's read, any, read either of those. I've, I've heard those same stories. One of my students recently read Coming of Age in Carhide and didn't love it. I was surprised. Um, uh, but I, I, I don't, I don't know if that had anything to do with the gender thing. He, he was talking about some other issues. Um, so I, I don't know. I think it was in Winter's King I read that she used, you know, female, you know, like she, her right. pronouns for right. all the Gathanians. Yeah, I've read that as well, but I've never read that story. Or maybe I have, but it's like so long ago, I can't remember it. Uh-huh. Yeah, I didn't even realize that they existed until this morning, so right. I didn't get right. it, to, didn't read them, but I'd be curious to check them out. Um. All right, cool. So, we're, yeah, we're pretty much out of time, so we should maybe start getting into some final thoughts here. Um, so Sarah, any other final thoughts, anything else, uh, you wanted to say about left-handed darkness that we haven't gotten to? Not about left-handed darkness specifically, but I think everybody who is listening should Google Ursula K. Le Guin abortion because it'll go probably right to the, uh, essay she wrote about it in which again, she had to describe herself in the third person in order to feel comfortable talking about it because she was, you know, uh, very uncomfortable with the idea of, of, of writing down like a memoir, um, which is unfortunate for us readers, but it's also, it sort of makes her a more interesting person that she wanted to keep that to herself. And she was very mysterious about it. And so it's a wonderful, wonderful description of, of, of a very unlikely, you know, figure in terms of, um, his time period, uh, you know, giving her support for that. And we would not have any of what we have had she done that. And even if she had tried to seek it out herself and gotten some sort of unsafe abortion, we would have, you know, potentially lost her before she did all of this wonderful work. I guess that's an interesting point that I never thought about that she, you know, she wrote so many books and several books about writing, but did she, but she never wrote a memoir or? no. And she wrote, she started really, you know, writing in earnest when she was almost 40, right? Like she, I mean, she was, I think she was trying to make it work as a poet at first and, you know, certainly in college and then, you know, sort of discovered how to make her very unique voice work as she, you know, found that science fiction was a good fit. But she had already had, I think, all of her children um, by the time she really became known as a writer. Yeah. That's interesting. So, uh, so Lisa, any final thoughts, anything else you want to say about left-handed darkness? Um, you know, one thing I think that's cool that we didn't really talk about, but we've been talking about binaries and oppositions and, and how Le Guin is good at sort of reminding you that the ways we construct the world, uh, and how easily we can shift them. And I just wanted to sort of remind everyone we were talking about that generally I is, he's not just of the ecumen and of earth, but that he's, he's, he's black and, and I think Asian as well, actually. Um, so, but it's interesting that she chooses to have, right, a non-white, non-Flash Gordon hero, which in some ways feels really cool and groovy and new wave, but he's still playing the part of the oppressor, right? So it's just yeah. one more level of <laughs> irony. So I just wanted to note the irony <laughs> never ends with Le Guin. She just, it just goes and goes and goes. There's always so yeah. many levels to appreciate. Everything's subversive. Uh, Raj, final thought. I just want to say thank you for giving me the opportunity to read it again because I this this read through I just found it more beautiful than I had had imagined than I had remembered. Sorry, um, and I would recommend that if people give it a try and it doesn't quite you know work for them, that maybe you know revisit it a little later down the line and see if it changes. And if you still don't like it, there's nothing wrong with you. That's fine. But you know, I my experience was that it you know it took some time for me to appreciate it. And now it's going to be on the list of books that I go back to like every few years, probably for a reread. And it's also not very long. So that's helpful. Yeah. Hmm. It's like a fine wine. It ages yeah. well. It does. <laughs> well, yeah, because because as I said, my 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 initial impression was like, oh, I, I was a little disappointed that I thought it was going to be more about gender than it seemed to actually be. Um, and there were some parts I thought were kind of slow. But it, it was it was almost it was like crossing the the goblin ice, you know, where when you're in the middle of it, you're like, I don't know if I'm enjoying this. But then you get to the end and you you sort of look back over the fields of snow and you're like, I did it, you know. And uh, that was really my experience reading the book is like I said, yeah, it really had an emotional punch for me at the end and everything fell into place. And I'm I could see, you know, why everything was the way it was. And 
Um, you know, I, I do think that there's lots of room for other authors to write about um, about sort of Gethenian type characters and explore that in more detail. But I, I'm certainly glad that this book exists exactly the way it is. And I'm, I'm definitely glad I read it. I'm sorry it took me so long to get around to it. But um, but thank you guys for giving me uh, the opportunity to, to read this book for the first time. Yeah. Uh, all right, cool. So let's uh, wrap things up there. So we've been speaking with Sarah Lynn Mishner, Rajan Khanna, and Lisa Yazik. So thanks everyone so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. And that was our panel. So big thanks again to Sarah Lynn Mishner, Rajan Khanna, and Lisa Yazik for joining us on the show. And remember that Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time contribution, you can do that via check or PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so that was our show. So thanks everyone for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.